now it's working. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Good evening, and welcome to Write the Docs Bay Area. My name is Maggie Farrow, and I am the San Francisco City Coordinator. Um, tonight, we will be hearing from Aaron McKean about document templates for fun and profit. Um, Aaron, will your slides be available to everyone later tonight? Are there slides, or is it more of just the conversation format? There are slides that I uh, wasn't able to get them approved for release, but if people want, uh, there'll be a video that is videoing now. Um, All right. If people need any links, uh, they can hit me up and I will share them in the Slack for Write the Docs. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you also to Alyssa from the Write the Docs virtual meetup for hooking us up with our location today in this lovely Zoom call. Um, do we want to do our usual show of hands? How many people here who have their cameras on are mostly focused on technical writing? Uh, how many people on development or engineering? On product support or other? All right. It's a little more anticlimactic in a Zoom call than it is in person, but I think it's still valuable information for the speaker to have. Um, tonight, we will be hearing primarily from Aaron McKean, but we will also be hearing from Clarence Cromwell, who will be facilitating from here on, and who will be giving a more full introduction of tonight's speaker. So Clarence, if you'd like to take it away. Clarence, you are still muted. Please unmute and then take it away. Okay, there we Thank go. Thank you. So I know Aaron through the Good Docs project, so I uh, was uh, the person who instigated all this by asking her to come here. So I'm going to read a quick introduction um, before she starts off, and then I'm going to let Aaron let Aaron take it away. So um, Aaron McCain is the Docs Advocacy Program Manager in the Open Source Programs Office at Google, and I was going to ask you to tell us a little bit more about that before you get going. Sure. Um, big job title and very interesting and thought provoking. But Aaron has also been editor in chief of American Dictionaries for the Oxford University Press, the founder of WordNick.com, the world's biggest online dictionary, and the author. I'll just say the author of many books because I <laughs> felt like there might have been too many to count, including a series of weird and wonderful words books and the best-selling novel, The Secret Lives of Dresses. Um, and of course, Erin is a member of the Good Docs Project, um, and she's here today to talk about what is the Good Docs Project. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. Um, <laughs> what do all. templates do to improve documentation, and what is a minimum viable doc set? And with that, I will hand it over to Erin. Cool, all right, I will try and present. Let's see if I can make this work. And... Sorry, I have roughly 10,000 tabs open on my machine, so let me get to the right one. And All right, how does that look? We, it, we see your Zoom um, screen, right? like your Zoom web thing right now. We're not seeing uh, okay. slides yet. All right, let me figure out what I did. Um, when you share your screen, you're given options to share the full desktop or a specific window. It seems like maybe you shared a specific window. Oh, you know what? I, yes, sorry. Um, how about now? Now it's yes. right. Awesome. Thank you. Well, hello. Thanks for having me here. Uh, as Clarence said, I work for Google in the Open Source Programs Office, and I run the Docs Advocacy Program. And what that really means in English is that uh, I, my, my remit is to make it easier for open source uh, projects to have better documentation. And I do that through a couple of different programs. And one that you may have heard of is the uh, Season of Docs program. And uh, Season of Docs is a program that matches open source projects with the seasoned technical writers who may not have experience in open source. And um, the, the technical writers get a stipend and the, um, uh, the projects and the technical writers work together to decide on a docs project that will be 
useful for the project and educational for the technical writer. And uh, the organization applications are open for another week. And then um, on May 11th, we'll announce what organizations have been accepted. And then technical writers can start exploring projects with those orgs to see if they might want to work together. And uh, technical writer applications are due in early June. So that's a big part of what we do in the open source programs office around documentation. Um, I also work on Doxy. I'm sorry. I also work on Doxy, which is a, a theme for the Hugo static site generator, which is um, geared towards technical documentation. And uh, by work on Doxy, I mostly mean I talk to people about Doxy a lot. And I try to fix what small bugs I can, but the main development work is done by some technical writers inside Google who are pretty awesome people, I have to say. Um, and uh, Clarence also mentioned that I uh, run WordNIC, the online dictionary and API. And I, uh, I really enjoy running WordNIC. I think everybody should run a giant online dictionary as a hobby. It really makes your Sundays go by pretty fast. Um, it also has an API. We serve about 50 million API calls a week. And uh, if you don't know WordNIC, I know a couple people have already mentioned this on the call, but my technical co-founder at WordNIC back when we were a venture-backed startup and not a 501c3 uh, was Tony Tam, who's the guy who invented Swagger. And I like to joke that Tony uh, had to come up with Swagger because otherwise he would have spent all his time answering my questions about what the API parameters were. So uh, the, only, the only claim I can make to Swagger is that I did not stop him um, from creating Swagger. But if, uh, if you are working with Swagger now, the open API spec, I feel your pain. Um, and I also run the Semicolon Appreciation Society. And usually when we're in an in-person meeting, I give away stickers. I really like stickers. You probably have figured that out already. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have stickers to give away today. Hopefully at some point we'll all be in the same physical location again and I can give you some stickers. So that's a long introduction. And so um, I said I worked um, on docs advocacy for the Open Source Programs Office at Google. And um, docs advocacy, I feel like it really needs a little bit of a explanation. And so when I talk about docs advocacy, we mean that it's a practice that's developer focused, not necessarily technical writer focused, of encouraging better software documentation, whether through making good docs yourself, helping others produce docs, or by creating a culture that enables good docs to be produced. And I think I put this here today because I think that docs advocacy is really a big part of why templates are important because with a template, you're actually being an advocate for the kind of documentation that you want to see in the world. If you didn't think that was good documentation, you wouldn't bother to make a template for it. And so your template helps others produce the kind of documentation that you want to see. And it also creates a culture where people who aren't necessarily full-time documentarians or technical writers are encouraged to make documentation and are given an on-ramp and a way to do so. And we talk about it as being developer focused because there's a lot of stuff in the world that needs documentation and there are not enough people to do the documenting. So if you can move some of the, I'm not going to say simpler, but at least maybe more comprehensible tasks closer to the metal of what has to be documented, then valuable documentarian and tech writer cycles can be spent on higher order tasks. And at the end of the day, there'll be more good documentation for everybody. That's the plan, at least. And so why do we need more documentation? Well, I'm focusing here on um, open source as kind of the, uh, the domain, but there's a lot of documentation about the importance of documentation. There's a lot of research about the importance of documentation in that it's a key decision factor that developers uh, think about when they're choosing open source. And that bad documentation is one of the biggest problems. And that lack of documentation, it just keeps people away from things that they would otherwise happily use. And so 
the reason that uh, I get to work on this for the Google Open Source Programs Office is because we realize that you can't have a sustainable, useful, active open source project if there's no documentation or if there's incomplete documentation or if there's bad or wrong documentation. It's just not, it's an uphill slog to get a good open source project off the ground anyway. And not having great docs just makes it much, much, much harder. Um, but just telling people, oops, sorry, just telling people make more docs and make them more better doesn't really work. Like if you, if you put out a mandate without giving people the help that they need to do the thing that you want them to do, then you're just kind of another person going blah, 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 and the problem is not really gonna get helped or fixed or solved in any way. Um, so one of the, one of the points uh, that we think about a lot when we're trying to think about how to influence open source projects is we can't just tell people to do stuff, especially in open source where people are mostly volunteers and doing it for love and possible glory and not so much for money. Um, we have to give them the tools to make it easier. Uh, we also have to give them recognition. And that's also been a problem sometimes in open source that people who make code contributions often get a lot of recognition, but people who make docs contributions, maybe not so much. And um, so templates are one way that you can say, hey, docs are important. And also, here's something to help you. And that's something that Clint and I have been working with is the Good Docs Project. This is the Doctopus, who is the mascot of the Good Docs Project. And again, if we ever get to see each other in person, I have literally thousands of Doctopus pins and stickers piled up around my desk in Google San Francisco office on Spear Street. And someday I will be able to touch those again and hand them to other people. Uh, the Doctopus mascot is in the Good Docs Project repository. He, he comes in different colors. He has lots of different accessories. This pencil is only one. I think he's got a typewriter and possibly also a monocle. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Docs, Good Docs Project Doctopus, that's the project mascot. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the other option for the mascot was the Tem Platypus, which, you know, had a vocal a small but vocal uh, constituency, um, but the doctopus was a little bit easier to draw than a tem platypus. So the doctopus is what we have, and I'm very, very, very fond of him. But anyway, the Good Docs Project is an open source project to create docs templates for tops doc, top documentation use cases, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And of course, we would love contributors who will someday get doctopus swag. Um, so what is the Good Docs Project? It's an independent open source project. So I work for Google. I'm very happy to be employed by Google, but the Good Docs Project is not a Google-led or owned open source project. We're happy to have Googlers involved. Um, it's focused on the goal of providing templates and checklists for common open source documentation needs. Uh, it's governed by a project steering committee, and it's global which makes having calls really painful, as Clarence and I have found. Um, uh, we have people in Australia, in the UK, in Africa, and it's still very early, so there's plenty of ways to get involved and to make a significant contribution. Uh, there's the website, gooddocsproject.dev. Visit the site, join the mailing list. Like every other thing in the world, we also now have a Slack, which is a much, much, much lower traffic than the Write the Docs Slack. I have to say. It is very easy to keep up with. You could check it once a week and not really miss anything, at least at this point. Um, and we have some open issues, but right now we're really working on creating personas and use cases for both docs creators and docs users, cataloging all the different docs types in a kind of Borgian way, and then uh, working on minimum viable doc sets for different combinations of users and project types. So it's still, again, very early days. So please join. And so I was, I was thinking about, okay, well, I've talked about the Good Docs project and talked about, hey, we're making templates and we're making templates because we want to help open source projects, many of which are small and don't have contributors who are technical writers or documentarians. We really wanna help them get started but I haven't really said anything about why templates, right? Like, 
I haven't really given you any backup for why we're talking about templates. So I'm going to back up a little bit and give some backup, I hope. But so when we're talking about templates, I think that at least if you're here, you didn't have like a knee jerk response that was like, no, I don't need templates. We don't need no stinking templates. Like, why would I need templates? You have at least some interest in the utility of templates. Um, but, you know, there are all kinds of templates. And this is one kind of template, right? You, I, uh, is everybody familiar with Mad Libs as a templating system? I mean, yeah. And, you know, at the risk of like over explaining the joke, Mad Libs are really only funny because they highlight the problem with templates, which is if you put nonsense in, you get nonsense out, right? If you have no understanding of what the template is supposed to do and you don't know the domain, it doesn't matter what you put in the slots, it's all gonna be junk. Funny junk, probably, but still, like, not great. And so when we talk about templates, I did read one paper which talked about templates as an information appliance, or which I thought was really cool. Like, yes, I would like an information appliance. I would like to set it to high and like put it on a spin cycle. But I think that anyone who's done significant technical writing or um, documentation work knows that the answer to a lot of questions about what should this document look like is kind of it depends, right? You've worked on documents, you know that that's kind of the answer. And a lot of the conversations, Clarence can probably back me up on this, that we've been having around templates in the Good Docs project is kind of like, okay, well, yes, we need a template, but what kind of template? Well, it depends. And um, so templates are actually documentation about documentation, right? They're meta documentation. So your template is documentation about how to do documentation which brings it back to the it depends argument again. But that said, I think there are some things that need to be highlighted about the use of templates that may sometimes aren't immediately apparent because we think of templates as a way to help people make something but they also really help people focus. They're like thinly disguised checklists they help you focus on what you might want to include. I think another kind of template that um, we see in kind of everyday non-documentation life that is a good metaphor for documentation templates is a packing list, right? I don't know if you've ever gone on a big trip and like looked at a packing list online or maybe you have a packing list that you use over and over again. And you're like, okay, well, yeah, bathing suit is on my packing list, but I'm going to Antarctica. So I'm going to ignore that part because it, again, it depends. And so, but I might want to be reminded to take my sleeping mask because I am going to Antarctica and it's the summertime because I'm not crazy. I mean, this is all assuming we ever get to go anywhere again. Um, and so when we think about templates as information appliances, as kinds of checklists, they help focus you on what to think about which then helps you do the thinking. And um, I think another advantage of templates is much less writer focus. It's less focused on the production of the documentation or the content, but it's more focused on the user. So if you think about a user who's going to encounter many different kinds of documentation in their lifetime, if they're curious at all about anything, having easily identifiable like flavors or genres of documentation helps users, especially new users, orient themselves in the information. So if every kind of documentation was just a, a wild carnival of originality with no features in common, that would be really hard for users. I mean, think about how, how annoying it is to go to a new grocery store, again, supposing that you actually get to leave the house, um, like, where do they put the black eyed peas? I've seen them with the vegetables. I've seen them with the beans. I've seen them with chili. I've seen them with the regional or ethnic food section. And they could conceivably be in each place. But if they were like a single grocery store template, they would always be in the same place or very similar places. Um, so templates don't just help the writer who may not be 
confident in their decisions around documentation by helping them know what to focus on. If templates are widely adopted as types of documentation, then users will know, oh, hey, this is a how-to. I know that there's probably gonna be steps here and I can skim and look for the steps. Um, and I also think that templates also help you scope correctly. They keep you from putting in too much stuff, or at least they try to. If you have a template, you have an idea of kind of what the proposed volume should be. And that way you don't put in too much stuff and risk over overloading your, your reader. Um, so templates are information appliances, information artifacts that help you control scope. They provide reassurance to both the reader and the writer. And um, as the Good Docs project, we're trying to make templates that kind of help with the it depends question because we're working towards the idea of minimum viable doc sets that are uh, the combination of what does the user need, what kind of project is it? And so when we asked, uh, Clarence asked folks who were signing up for this if they had ideas about what a minimum, doc, minimum viable doc set should be. And um, there were a lot of people who basically answered, nope, that's why I'm coming. And, uh, but one person said that whatever gets a user from point A to point B with the least amount of hurt is a minimum viable doc set. And I really like that definition. And I should point out that I am a professional definition liker. So um, yes, like, okay, a minimum viable doc set is not based on the project. It's based on the combination of the project plus the user. So the minimum viable doc set for say an API might be just the API reference for a very experienced developer who already knows the domain. But the minimum viable doc set for that same API might have to include use cases if the audience is a product manager who's evaluating subscribing to that API as a software as a service product. So you can't just say, oh, okay, for an API, you need this kind of documentation. You have to say, okay, for an API, if you have these kinds of users, you need these kinds of documentation at minimum. And maybe you can't do it all at once. So maybe you target one group of users first. Maybe you target the product manager because you really need the money from selling your API as a service. Or maybe you're an open source project and you're targeting the uh, trend setting developer um, with some use cases that are really hot or um, really silly so that your project goes viral. Um, so it's a combination of your needs, the project type, and the user needs. So sometimes when I've been talking uh, to technical writers about templates and the Good Docs project and documentation, I get a kind of jokey horror response, which is, are you trying to keep, put technical writers out of business? Right? If you make templates for everything, like, what am I gonna do? And so for the Good Docs project, the audience is not necessarily professional technical writers. It's really developers who might otherwise have no documentation or um, I'm sure that I think the technical term is half-assed documentation or, um, or just documentation that's not focused in the way that a template would focus it. And even if these templates are used by people at for-profit companies to make better docs, if we raise the bar, for minimum viable documentation across the board, if the MVD is really truly the minimum, and we make those basic docs just table stakes, it proves once again that great documentation is a strong product differentiator. So in some times now, the product differentiator is docs or no docs, but it really should be docs or great docs. And I think, uh, having a kind of baseline templatized um, documentation environment helps a lot. In the same way that now uh, documentation in a way is almost where testing was a while back, where 
now having some kind of testing is the bare minimum in many places. And a lot of places have full continuous integration, continuous deployment with automatically de running test suites. And by raising the bar there, we've raised quality kind of across the board. Um, so again, I want to say it's very early days for the Good Docs project, which means it's a great time to join because I still have so much swag. You want to join before the swag runs out. Um, so especially if you have strong opinions loosely held, because having a lot of different opinions in an open source project is really key towards making it successful. There are a lot of open source projects out there that just scratch one particular person's itch. And they're great, and it's wonderful to open source those things, but it's even better to have an open source project that solves problems for a lot of different constituencies or users. And um, this would probably be, I think I'm a little under time, but nobody ever got mad at you for going under time. Um, I would love to talk about this and get your feedback and answer questions. Um, and I hope what I've said has made sense. And also I like this slide because this was the best part of being in the Atlanta airport several months ago. Um, <laughs> but I can stop sharing so I can see more of your faces. And uh, yeah, well anyway, thank you so much for your attention and for letting me rant about templates. Thank you, Erin, for that wonderful presentation and especially for the delightful motivational sign at the end. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone for coming. Do we have questions for our presenter? You can put them in the chat now or I think if someone wants to come off mute, that's probably fine. Now I can see all your friendly faces. It's nice to see familiar folks too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to, uh, oh, <laughs> no, please, please. Um, yeah, no, I, I think this is really great. We, we've kind of been doing um, templating some in, within our company um, to help developers write like our first draft of docs and things that we're doing. And um, so I guess I'm kind of curious, um, well, I guess, like you said, it's new, and so you're trying new things and things like that. Um, and so where are you first focusing right now? More on just getting lots and lots of input? Or have you like decided, like, hey, here's one area where we can start, like, what's a basic readme template look like, or something like that? So yes, that was not a yes or no question, but I'm just going to say yes. Um, so we've had. I think a good amount of like discussion about what the philosophy should be. And now we're like, we got to just start making some stuff, throw it against the wall and see who yells, right? Like it's much easier always to react to a shitty first draft or a shitty first template. So um, we're really starting to push those out. I have made a commitment that I'm going to contribute a template for um, a communications guide. So, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of you should tell people how they can reach you and more importantly, so not just a contact us page, but also you need to set expectations because a lot of users of open source sometimes have outsized expectations, not to say entitlement to your time or your energy and not letting them know that it might take you two weeks to respond to an issue means that you might get an email every hour on the hour until you do. So the communications template would have things like, okay, here's how you contact us. Here's what you can expect in terms of response time. Here's how to escalate. So if you tell people how to escalate, then they might not ping you on every available social media platform to try to escalate. And you can also tell people like where you look if, um, if there's discussion going on. So for example, you could say, hey, we have a Slack and we, mo we monitor the discussion there. So if you wanna talk about this project, talk about it there, but we don't actually hang out on Reddit. So if you talk about us there, you're probably not gonna get anybody from the project to respond. 
So giving that kind of guideline, and then also for bigger projects, giving guidelines about, okay, we have a code of conduct, and the code of conduct also governs you elsewhere. So if you're talking about our project, we expect you to be respectful to people who have questions. And you can also say things like, if you come into the project and ask us a bunch of questions, but you're really not following our code of conduct and being respectful, then we probably won't answer your question. So just like you would say to um, say your child, where you say, what's the magic word? Like, come back and say, please. Um, so anyway, that's the template that I have committed to trying to produce by uh, the end of the month, I think. We've had some discussion on the Good Docs project mailing list about it so far. Um, but yeah, right now is the time that if you have a very strong opinion about the best way to do a certain kind of doc for a certain kind of project and a certain kind of user, uh, you could get this basically immortalized by contributing your template at this point um, and seeing if anybody like jumps in to uh, fix it. I'm very excited about the communications template, as you could probably tell. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, tell people what to do, and then maybe you have a better chance of them doing it, and you have an excuse to not interact with the people who don't do it. I found submitting helpful. I had a set of templates, and um, I will say that there are a lot of different clashing ideas in the good docs project there are different perspectives and so you come up with the perfect template and i think the the key is that it all changes for somebody else in a different company a different kind of product with different users so the tech the template looks really good to you and then you take it in and people go oh no that's not it at all no not even close and then the result is that you have a really you know prolonged debate and you really do have to rethink well this is a template um, you know, do I really need these things and did I leave something out? It does. So things do get a lot better by being looked at from so many different perspectives. Um, so if you're, if you're someone who's like a technical writer who wants to make templates for the developers in your company, which, which is not a bad thing to do, it helps to submit them here get some feedback. And then you're either making them better before you share them or maybe just sharing them with other developers at other companies who would benefit as well. And if you want to bring templates into your org, but you haven't had um, enough weight to make that happen, you can reputation wash your templates by running them through an open source project and then pointing to them and saying, hey, this open source project that involves all these people from all these companies, they, like, they liked this template, so why wouldn't we use it internally? Now, do check with your company's uh, equivalent of the Open Source Programs Office to figure out how you can contribute uh, directly. Um, it's a, I think our templates are we're we're open we're OSI compliant licenses. So I think Apache is what we're going with and zero BSD. Um, so those are non-contaminating licenses, and so your company should be happy with those licenses. Yeah, but wasn't there, I think that there was a thing where there's, there are licensing issues if you take templates that already belong to your company and copy and paste them over to the project. There's yes, get permission. Lawyers involved, get permission, yeah. But if you come in on your own time and write a template, then it's your own time. Depending on what your company's policy is on open source. Your time um, yeah. belongs. Hopefully, hopefully you can do things <laughs> on your own time. Yeah. Yes. I was able to. Yeah. This is definitely not a situation where forgiveness is better than permission, I have to say. Agreed. For people who might not know yet, can you talk a little bit about what a non-contaminating license is and why that is a useful feature of the Good Docs project? I am not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> I am a little bit of a licensed nerd at this point because I think you can't really get excited about open source without being a licensed nerd. But basically, um, some licenses require that if you incorporate material with that license or use it, then everything it touches also has to be licensed in a similar fashion, which makes that those 
that kind of licensed material very difficult to use in some kinds of commercial endeavors. Um, so it's kind of like a magical power that whatever it touches, like King Midas, instead of turning to gold, it turns into that license. And it, that's a very legal description, not at all. But if you're curious about licenses, the, the OSI, here, let me dump a link to the OSI somewhere where it can be found. Um, the Open Source Initiative, I'm gonna jump in and glass initiative. that for you. Oh, thank you. That would be awesome because I have so many tabs open at this point that, um, well, it's terrifying really. So I shouldn't open another one. Um, question for you. Um, when you're thinking about and giving guidance about template creation, how are you incorporating micro and macro content patterns based on the types of content that you would expect to be put in those templates? That is an excellent question because we've been having discussions about trying to make the templates as modular as possible. So um, the only problem is it's kind of like macro and micro services. Like what are the boundaries of the bits? And that is, um, that's the kind of question that can keep you going for a really long time. So I would say right now we're thinking more of document type templates and then maybe having, um, I would describe it as like a choose your own Sunday bar. Like it's always going to have ice cream. Otherwise you're not at a choose, like make your own Sunday bar. Right. But you could add refinements in the form of like extra cherries or maybe, you know, maybe you're a nuts person in your Sunday, but what's the minimum Sunday? I think ice cream plus one other ingredient is like, if I were going to argue the Sundayness of Sundays, that's what I would argue. I'm not going to get into, is this a hot dog discussion? But um, although actually I will get into, is this a hot dog? Cause I think I have a really good heuristic of is a hot dog a sandwich, right? Oh. Like, which is if you ask somebody to run out and get you a sandwich and they come back with a hot dog, how mad are you? Right? So again, like I think with templates, uh, if you said this is a template for X, how mad would the person be about what you left out, assuming that they knew enough to be mad? Right, because like if you go out, if, if an alien says, give me a sandwich, and perhaps they don't know the boundaries of sandwichness, and you come back with a hot dog, they might not have the knowledge to be mad. So we have a test to find out if someone is an alien. <laughs> right, how mad are they about, um, yeah. So, but this is probably getting into some like uh, half remembered philosophy of language stuff from my long ago linguistics degree. Does everybody know about conversational implicature, which is like my favorite stupid language trick? Like, okay, so conversational implicature is like, what did you actually ask me in a way? So if I ask you, can you pass the salt? And you say yes, but you don't actually hand me the salt. You've like violated the principle. And, um, and also you're kind of a jerk. But yeah, so like what, what is implied by the template? And are you fulfilling that promise, that implicit promise that the template has made to you? This is a big question because <laughs> some people came into this good docs thing with completely different ideas about what a template would be and do. It's probably a good time to insert this in the conversation. Yes. And after sort of, you know, flailing around for a while, I settled on something that was more like a checklist of the content that should be in a really small document. So if I am writing a quick start, what is, what should be in it? Or, or even smaller, if I'm writing an API reference document, what absolutely has to be in it so that it won't fail as an API reference um, guide and just a checklist. And then other people have an idea of, no, it's, it's actually a template in the sense that it has headings and some boilerplate and I can just begin to fill things in or one step beyond that. Oh, maybe it's even part of 
something that I can use to build documentation. Like I download this package, uh, it has fields that I can fill in and then it will build a book. And I went, oh God, we're just going to, now we're going to fight about, <laughs> now we're going to fight about Markdown versus X versus this versus that. Yeah, we um, did have that fight. Tool do we use? Yeah. And when it started going that way, I said, I'm out, no, no tools. We can't have tools because we'll just fight over tools until the end of time. Yeah. Um, it's almost like nesting dolls, right? Like mm -hmm. the more domain knowledge you have, the easier it is for you to do a checklist. And then moving one step up, like, okay, well, I don't really have a strong opinion about design. So sure, give me your flavor of headings. Mm -hmm. um, I think though that it's very hard to do a Mad Lib style template. I think it's better to have either a checklist or maybe some lightweight headings, but also show some fictional examples that people can use to model themselves on. Like sometimes when I'm just stuck, like trying to write the introduction to something, which is always the hardest thing, I'll just like go pick some random book off the shelf and copy the first three sentences because they'll be complete nonsense, but it'll be enough to get me over the hump of writing the introduction. And then I can come back to them and say, why is it was, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, like in the front of my document, that's about something completely different. Um, but having fictional and hopefully facetious examples of what the first step in the quick start looks like. Like, you know, if you want to say to people, to give them the idea of, okay, you really have to start as wide out in your quick start as to make sure that they're in the right place. So maybe like, okay, well, to operate this time machine, you should make sure that you're in the solar system because this time machine is not calibrated for other solar systems. And if they have, if they miss that crucial step, well, their time machine's not gonna work. I'm very fond of time machine related examples because I know that they, well, I'm pretty sure that they're not gonna be obviated by the creation of actual time machines. They're always accurate. Yeah, you know, they can't be out of date. <laughs> We have um, a, an internal docs template that in each section has like a little blurb. My, my coworker made it with like little emojis in it. So like it has a little brain for everything that's a tip about like, this is the kind of thing you might be thinking about here, or this is the sort of information you would want to say in this section. Um, but then also uh, ones that have little magnifying glasses that are examples. And in our case, they're actual real examples, not like fake ones, because they're pointing to other examples of docs that we have in our, our regular documentation. Um, and, and I think that's been really helpful to have sort of like, not just a heading or something that says like, check off, make sure you have this thing, but like, this is what this thing would look like. And like, this is what things that you might want to think about when you make this section. I think that's a really important point because most of the people who use a template don't know what they don't know because if they didn't need a template they wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And so trying to point out the the assumptions and the things to think about is really helpful. Um, because otherwise you kind of get into sometimes the recipe problem like the <laughs> the soft peaks problem like if you know in the olden days before we had youtube and you read a recipe and it said beat the egg whites till soft peaks form and i'm like okay what what is a soft peak really how soft is soft of course now you can just go watch a video for any of this but trying to tell people things that they might not have a frame of reference for is really important in things like recipes and templates because if they already knew how to do it they wouldn't be there Totally. I have a recipe for my grandmother that says to like boil uh, this frosting recipe until it looks like the bubbles are coming from the bottom. And I just don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of what? <laughs> Aren't they so always coming from the bottom? Like where do the bubbles in boiling come from? I don't know. But. <laughs> that would send me down like such a rabbit hole of like researching cavitation and I would be like in some weird physics land. 
and I'd know like way too much about like the properties of uh, weird liquids and I still wouldn't have frosting at the end of it. I have a question for Jessica. What uh, document types do you have templates for? Is it for like on the level of a guide or a chapter? Or? Um, I guess, well, it's, it's more like, it's basically right now, I guess you could call it maybe like a chapter. So it's something that goes into our project template for when we're developing like a new feature um, or a project. And so one of the things in that is the customer facing docs. And so there's a template for that. And it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of all purpose because like it's got like a troubleshooting section or a usage and billing section because we talk about like how much that would be and um, how it works, you know, so it's kind of a catch all and then you take the sections you need and don't need out of that. But is like if you were to go to like the section on Netlify forms, like how do you build all those different parts of that and it's got all the checks, uh, all the sections of that and how to do those things. So it's kind of general, like definitions, requirements, getting started, I'm reading through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, how it works, limitations, and um, so like the different building blocks of something that might be, if it's a smaller feature on just one page, if it's uh, something bigger, it might be over several pages. Is there a way to decide what bits you need? Not too much yet. I mean, at the moment, like there is in in each section something talking about like there may be, you know, like under limitations, there may be many or there might be just a few or there, you know, you might not actually need this section if you don't have any scenarios where you can't use this feature or something like that. Um, so there's a little bit of guidance within the template itself. Um, and we really need to do more to develop that. But at the moment, it's kind of just all within one big doc. Um, so. And it's not like the idea is for something to help someone who's writing an initial draft uh, or even just like a brain dump of what fits into this for the people who are more working on this or planning what it is that they're going to make because we try to write the docs first. Um, and then later will be significantly more refined by actual writers um, as the process goes along. So. That's cool. And they also have other folks that they can ping to say, yeah. do I really need this here? Absolutely. Yeah. So like, do I even need to put anything in the section or <laughs> I don't even know what this means. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, which I suppose is easier than sometimes like open source where you're like, here's a template and you've made your own open source project and, you know, do stuff with it. And maybe file an issue to ask a question. <laughs> um. Right, or the person who's working through the templates might be the sole developer mm -hmm. on a prod on a small project and and get a little overwhelmed by yeah. wait exactly. do, do I need all this stuff? Yes, it would definitely be overwhelming <laughs> to someone who is just doing that. Like, you can't just repurpose this into a, like, oh yeah, now good doc project's done. Nope. <laughs> but yeah, I think we can definitely. Um, take some of these things and adapt that to some of the other stuff. And something I'm working on right now is a template for uh, contributor guides, um, for, which I think is another one of those ones, kind of like the communication where it's like, feels more similar across projects. You know, like that one is, is less of an it's depends kinds of thing. You know, you want to tell somebody, what should your pull request look like? What do you need to do to run this locally? What do you need to like, um, should you, if there's an issue, should you comment on it to say you're gonna work on it? You know, those sorts of things that, which I think yeah. makes such a huge difference in terms of like getting people to participate and contribute because like, if you don't know and you have to guess what's the right way to do it, that's super intimidating. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's, it definitely is that like first day of school feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Where you walk in and like, who, what, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I also think it's really helpful when the contributor guides specifically call out if the docs contribution process is different mm -hmm. or if there's a different process for contributing to things that aren't code. Like mm -hmm. 
if you want to contribute to tests, do this, or we expect you to do this, or um, uh, or whether there's an unspoken kind of uh, assumption that your first contribution will be something that's been labeled good first contribution, or whether you could just jump in and work on the most contentious part of the project just, you know, for fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like maybe don't like come in and say like, I really changed everything and I, I changed <laughs> 500 files and can you review it and merge it now? Right. I went in and added semicolons to everything because that's, you know, that's how it should be. Um, Actually, you know, if you appreciate the semicolon more when it's not in your JavaScript, I'm totally down with that too. Like you could appreciate it from whatever distance you deem appropriate. Um, yeah, I like, yeah, contribution or contributor guides, I think are really, um, uh, it's an all happy families are happy in the same way kind of problem. Mm -hmm. like they really do have a nice shape to them. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to know what to leave out because if, um, especially for, it's really interesting. I've been seeing more people doing hardware project contributor guides mm. and it's like, okay, well, you gotta have a raspberry Pi, like start there. Mm -hmm. Are there other templates that folks have been like, maybe someday when I get a spare 20 minutes, I'm going to work on this particular template and it's going to solve all my problems and I will be happy forever. I know that's a lot to ask of a template. Actually, Jessica said something pretty interesting earlier when she said that you write the docs, you're trying to write the docs first. Does that mean before any development or design or they kind of document the design at the same time as the, uh, as they build it? That's fascinating. I had this dream a couple of days ago. Um, I was on an IV drip, saline drip, and I was trying to learn a product that we were working, our product in our company, and try to document it, and I couldn't figure out anything. Then one of the team uh, developers comes over and says, oh, let me help. He injects a hallucinogenic into my drip. <laughs> and then suddenly everything went eureka. It all makes sense. I know what's going on now. <laughs> So, I'm not yeah. sure if that's a, a dream or a best practice, really. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of why I was surprised that you guys actually designed first. <laughs> I feel I've like heard there are no I've heard that, that works <laughs> temporarily. I think the docs don't make sense later, like after you're not on hallucinogens. At least that's what I've heard. <laughs> Not that we would ever promote the use of any potentially illegal substances in a video that will be on our YouTube channel because we'll be YouTube recorded. hates that and right. we would like to not get shut Remember, down. <laughs> don't do it, kids. <laughs> Prescription. Stay in though. school. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no. Um, I, I'm always fascinated by like docs driven development, test driven development. I, I, I feel like it's one of those disciplines like exercising right when you get up in the morning that feels amazing, works great, and is super hard to maintain under stress. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a work in progress that changes around from project to project, but I think we're starting to get more standardized on it. But yeah, it's the docs and the design kind of happen around the same time, sort of in tandem with each other. and. And the nice thing is that it gives everybody um, a common document that makes sense to everybody in the company um, to kind of gather around and talk about and, you know, get names for things and go through like, wait, if this is really hard to explain, like maybe make it simpler or maybe structure it differently and being able to talk those students through before people are super invested in the solution they've already made is super helpful. <laughs> but but it doesn't always happen. <laughs> that sounds lovely though. There, um, I mean, there are corporations that work on that same principle, right? There's the infamous Amazon memo that starts every meeting. You're not supposed to come in without a memo. PG&E 
not PG&E, P Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble also supposedly has a very strong memo culture um, where they have basically a template for making business decisions that just happens to be in the form of a business memo. Um, and I think when cultures can solidify around those practices, um, it's a nice leveler because it means that it's not just the loudest person or the most aggressive person or the person who can stay up all night coding a prototype and that their thing gets deployed because they already made it, um, that quote unquote wins. It, it can be really challenging though. I, I, um, I work on products where a lot of times I try to be part of the developer meetings. Um, in our case, uh, often our teams meet once a week. And I have in the past sometimes started the docs early so that we had things for people to look at and to try out like field engineers as well as developers. Um, but I found there's a real uh, breaking point uh, where if you do it too early, you end up rewriting too, too much versus um, waiting just long enough to have it solidify a little bit more, but still be involved at the point where they can more easily change things that you might find through experience trying them out um, will work. Yeah, I think part of it for us is like not not going too far into like, you know, like refining that documentation that's early, like because if you spend too much time like, you know, how can I explain this? It's kind of one of those things too sometimes where it's like that apocryphal Mark Twain quote that's like, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Like, you don't try and get it succinct. You don't try and like, be precise. Or you just like spit it all out and like, this is how I think it would work. And a lot of times it's not written by the tech writer. Like, in fact, what we're doing now is the product manager writes the first version of the docs. Um, and so like based on discovery and based on the design, like writing that and that being sort of like what drives it. but isn't quite refined yet to being as much what it's going to be at the end because yeah <laughs> it can change a lot <laughs> depending on how your particular company's processes run but especially if you're in an agile software development environment the artifacts that are kind of incidentally created through the development process often are sort of a first draft too and so that can also help if, for example, you're using a user story, that's going to be the same thing as you put in your about this feature paragraph because you want to say, what is this for? Who wants this? When do they want it? And that's also what the product manager or product owner is going to put into that top level user story. And then you look at your acceptance criteria and the acceptance criteria are when the user clicks this button, this thing happens. And then when you want to write a procedure, how to make this thing happen, it's like, well, click this button. <laughs> and so if you can kind of work backwards from the artifacts that are already being created, then I've found you can at least reduce the amount that needs to be rewritten because even though those things are going to change, you know which parts of your draft document are predictably going to need to change based on which of the product development artifacts have changed. That's cool. One thing that I saw when I was looking at templates um, was there was a there was an interesting article by the Norman Nielsen people like Don Norman and Jakob Jakob Nielsen I think they do a lot of user research uh, studies um, and user experience studies and their article is actually about page templates for websites not documentation templates although there's a, a fine line and they had, um, they were testing what users' assumptions were about the layout of pages by giving them basically wireframes with no text at all and just like buttons and sidebars and, and all sorts of things about, and then asking them, what do you, like, does this look usable to you? What do you think this is? Um, to try to get there. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, for the link there. Um, and I thought I was trying to figure out how that would apply to documentation templates. Like, could you just do the headers? 
and see if users could follow the flow, like just kind of reading the abstract or the outline. And could you do the headers with like Lam Lorem Ipsum text or Greek text so that they wouldn't even know what it was going to say, but say, hey, here is this collection of, you know, nonsense phrases. What kind of documentation do you think this is? Is this a tutorial? Is this a help? Is this, you know, a glossary? And see if they could just get the shape. I think it all depends on your, your users. Yep, it really all does come down to the users most of the time, huh? I think and this is why we kind of like go between user experience and writing. We have to know how how our users are going to experience something. Well, remember, there's no real generic users, and 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 it's really useful if you or your product management or your user experience or your um, have developed personas for the different types of users, so you can understand what content they're going to be looking for, how they'll consume it, and all these other bunches of things. Yeah. <laughs> um. mm -hmm. So I've actually done a paper prototyping of documentation similar to what you're describing, uh, where I just had uh, section headings and chapter headings. And I gave it to my developers. It was a very new product. So is what I'm like, the way I'm laying this out to guide the user through this does it make sense. And I think that's actually a valuable thing, um, especially when you have a very new product. So it can be done in that fashion. That's something that it, it really worked for me uh, really well at the time when I did that. When we reorganized our docs last year, we did some things like that. We did, well, we did card sorting when we were first deciding how we wanted to like outline it. Um, yeah. And, and so card sorting, I think, sounds kind of similar to what you were doing. And there's our online tools for that. And then another thing after we had the outline, which I think you could do at a page level too, is what they call tree testing, which would be like you give a person like a task that they need to do. Like you want to do, you know, find out how to install this. That's probably an easy one for a page of like a readme. <laughs> where would you look? And they'd say, hey, I want to look where it says installation. But, um, <laughs> but to ask somebody like, you want to figure out how to do this, or you want to find out about, you know, what this product does or et cetera, like where on this page in this list of headings or where in these group of pages, would you look to find it? And then you have like a way of like finding of validating whether your organization of content makes sense to other people who are actually using it. Um, we found it really helpful. Does anybody A, B test their information architecture in their docs to move the things around and see which ones work the best? I feel like you'd have to have a gajillion dollar budget to, to do that. My current tool doesn't have the infrastructure for it on the user display side, but with a not ridiculous budget, I have done it in the past, especially for in-app help, because if you already have A-B testing infrastructure set up on the site, you can kind of get it for free if your help content is hosted on the same site, where your B version of the page is just your alternate export from your help creation tool. Um. So another thing that, that we haven't talked about in terms of, of templates in the Good Docs project is what would we consider to be good metrics for the use of a template? So we talk about the benefits of templates is that it, it makes it a little bit faster to create documentation because people don't have to reinvent the wheel and they don't have to you know, remember things that are set out for them. Um, do we have any idea of uh, docs quality metrics that we could assign to documents created with templates or user satisfaction metrics? Are you asking about the quality of the, the templates or the docs you make with the templates? I, might I, I think that there's no way to measure the quality of a template without measuring the quality of the docs it produced. Like you can't mm -hmm. say a recipe is great until you've eaten the thing that it made. Mm -hmm. Um, but they can be measured separately. You're saying both then, right? 
Yeah, and saying, okay, well, if we think templates are good, mm -hmm. how would we measure that? And what would be the metrics we would look at? And, and I think one thing would have to be like, who's, who's using the template and is it saving them toil? And then are users more satisfied with documents that were made from templates? Like however we might measure that. And does the document do like what it says on the box, right? If it's a help document, does it actually help anybody? If it's a tutorial, does it actually teach? Possibly some sort of documentation bugs metric could work for that. Like how many people are reporting this as having a broken step or a missing step. Mm -hmm. uh, or reporting that they don't know how to do something that's already in there. <laughs> or isn't in there if it's you know something that's missing right. that's a use case that they need to cover that it isn't covered. Well, here's here's an interesting case um, because templates don't always they're not they don't always end up being used to create brand new documents from scratch. Um, right. My favorite use case is you're a technical writer, you make the template, but then you end up going to fix existing documents either because you, you thought it through and you want to hold that up next to the one document you made to see if it fits your ideal or um, in the case of like reference documents, you have a hundred iterations of the same thing and, you're, and you're, you're saying to yourself, well, did I do that right every single time? And so you use it as a checklist to go and, and validate, I guess, the documentation that you have. So on the question about quality, um, this is my story for the, for the evening. <laughs> that's that's what I ended up doing with with our reference documentation with the template where I made that you know that I that I built and uh, basically the template says if you don't have these things it will be bad and um, uh, a certain API that shall not be named didn't have those things and customers <laughs> complained and and it's sort of the conversation had like we should fix this sometimes probably we need to go through this checklist and then the complaints came in and everything that was complained about, you know, would have been fixed in the template. And then, so then the action plan was um, to take the template um, and make um, JIRA tickets by making the, you know, that make, copying that checklist into a ticket and applying it to this endpoint and this endpoint, this endpoint. So that they all have sort of a duplicate that's make it like this. And I think it's a long checklist, you know, in the API template and then many things were removed because they're automated. Like um, in one of those things that I, I won't be too specific, you know, you automate it, it gives you the, the, it gives you the path anyway, it gives you the um, syntax. So make sure that the syntax is there isn't important, but make sure that you've described the purpose of every endpoint and every collection of endpoints, you know, with a description, um, that was that wasn't always happening. So anyway, then the the there's there's um, somebody asked about a measurement of quality, but the final output, without knowing how to measure that, like on a scale of one to ten or whatever, but the final output is was quality. Applying the applying the checklist, it fixed everything that was a bug or would have been reported as a bug later. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good point, Clarence, especially like how many of us get perfect greenfield documentation that like has never been touched by human hands like that unsullied snow field. Right. That we get to be the first people to tromp across. Very rarely. I think that happens as often as we might like. Yeah. Well, and I think it also applies and I, if this is something that we've hit with our own template that it, it feels really useful when you're like describing like something new but like maybe you've added just a change to the way something works or you um, uh, mm -hmm. added a, a, a new little bit to this one functionality or something that changes in multiple pages of the documentation now because of this this feature upgrade or whatever um, how do you template people making docs for that like that's something that we've hit too is like, you know, like, oh, you just need to add like a paragraph somewhere or something that explains this. Like, how do you help somebody figure out where to put that? Where do they need to, what should they search for in the docs to see like, what do I need to change to 
go with this code contribution I've made. Or um, I think that can be, I mean, when you talk about it depends like that, <laughs> that one goes <laughs> way into the it depends, but can also I, be super challenging. I would be willing to bet a not insignificant amount of money that there is an engineer out there who's trying to figure out some kind of automatic highlighting of code to text in the docs and more power to them. Like if it works, that would be great, but it's going to be like a perpetual motion machine. Um, that is definitely an it depends. Um, so I, I just heard something really good in there though. Like I wouldn't know how to answer if you were adding a paragraph of task text about a new feature, but I thought I heard you say a code sample too. And I just realized that you could probably have a really good simple template for how to provide if you're an engineer providing a code sample to a writer, like here's the sample, and then what now? What comments do I need underneath that oh, to tell yeah. people what what parts are mandatory? And you know, this isn't going to work unless you use uh, a key or whatever you want to call it. And right. by the way, the one in there doesn't work because it's a <laughs> dummy, so you have to go get a key. And so when you copy and paste it, this won't work. I would have to say that I have I have cargo culted a lot of code samples because I did not know which bits were the important bits without taking them out and seeing what broke. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I was thinking more like, okay, if you change these underlying lines in the actual product code, what strings will that pull on in the documentation? Mm -hmm. um, and I think people who do a lot of like UX string templating, either because for internationalization or just because they, they have a good UX string template library, they're kind of a step ahead because they know every time, every place this UX string appears and I just changed the behavior that drives that UX string, then I've got a pretty easy search and replace job ahead of me. Mm. But, um, Well, you know, one thing I thought about is if, if, if any of y'all like wake up tomorrow morning going, boy, I wish there was a template for X, that would make my life so much easier. Clarence, we could just tell them to open issues, right? On the Good Docs Project templates repo, just say, hey, mm -hmm. for Christmas, Santa, I would like this template. And then that'll help us prioritize a little bit as well, because we can say, you know, 20,000 documentarians can't be wrong. They all want this one. Um, sorry, it's, it's, it's not very late where I am, but uh, I tend to get loopier the longer than I'm on a video call. So <laughs> I was thinking that your templates, Clarence, were kind of like Procrustean templates. Like you put them over the content, you lop off the bits that don't fit. Mm -hmm. in your second pass like um, yeah so it can be like almost a literal template like what you would use for quilting you just cut around the edges of your little plastic bit and yeah, nothing else is left yeah um, um that uh -huh. oh sorry I was going to say on that note of it being kind of a long Zoom call, <laughs> I'm not sure how many people joined based on the text version that said we were ending at 8 versus the meetup time version that said we were ending at 8.30. <laughs> but I think we should probably stop the recording now either way. I don't think we're going to get kicked out of the meeting at 8. Alyssa, correct me if I'm wrong. And so, so we, we can stay as long as you want to stay. But I will start stop the recording. So thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming.